Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table. We discuss issues of God and culture, and today our topic is bike riding. <laughs> Actually, it's more complicated than that. It's about engagement, and it's it's a wonderful story about how our guest, Pastor Neil Tomba, uh, decided to – I guess you did it during a sabbatical? Is that is that what I happened? I did it or? during my normal vacation time. During I did it in the month of June. Month of June. D- uh, took a series of bike rides and has documented it, and it's just a fascinating story. So we're calling it Neil's Incredible Adventure. <laughs> Adventure. Uh, That's the new name. <laughs> and uh, um, Neil Tomba graduated from Dallas Seminary in 1996. I, I was teasing with him earlier that it feels like it was a millennium ago, and it is. Yes. And so uh, God uh, placed him on staff at Northwest Bible Church uh, as minister to singles, and in February of 2001, he was a senior pastor, and he's been the senior pastor ever since. So you're coming up on uh, almost 20 years of yeah. senior pastoral work, and you were feeling so wonderful in this role that you thought, I just need to get out and ride my bike. Exactly. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, so um, he was an electrical engineering student at, at LSU, so he's a fighting tiger, um, and uh, you know became convinced of the gospel. I take it in college. Am I reading that right? When I was at LSU, sophomore in college, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I got to say basically in the same point in my life between my freshman and sophomore year at the University of Texas, which just shows that the nature of the university can have nothing to do with your spiritual life. <laughs> And uh, um, and uh, and so let's. Uh, the reason we have Neil here is Neil spoke in chapel beginning uh, of this semester, and in the midst of doing so, um, uh, showed clips of this of this bike ride that you took. And uh, so let's just go back to the very beginning. Uh, clearly, you were feeling deeply stimulated in the senior pastorate to be <laughs> taking this on. Um, uh, what? What motivated you to do this? Obviously, you must have been a bike rider to begin with. Yes. And uh, uh, but really, it's not about bike riding. What motivated you to do what we're about to describe? So, Daryl, all my life I've wanted just to kind of live outside. Mm-hmm. And people say to me, Neil, you like to exercise, don't you? I said I like to go out and play. Still, at my young age of fifty-eight, and so whether it's hiking or biking or running, I would just do this with people. And often, as I'm doing it, we'd run up on uh, next to somebody at White Rock Lake and just start engaging in a conversation. And I often found that it was actually easy to start talking about things with people that really matter. And I've been doing that just for years and doing it on the bike. And 18 years ago, when I was on a mountain in Colorado, I thought, I want to go across the country someday and document conversations that I have with people that really matter, whether it's about their values, their faith, whatever's going on in their life. And that was the start of that dream 18 years ago. So, um, so. Tell me how this. So you obviously you did, said you did this during a month of vacation, uh, which uh, to some people doesn't sound like much. How how far did you ride? Let's let's get the basic facts out. Three thousand miles, thirty three days. We took two days off. Started in Santa Monica, California. Finished in Annapolis, Maryland. Oh man! So truly across the country. Yes, and documented it along the way. And and I take it that part of the reason you thought this would work is that you'd had so many of these conversations to begin with that you knew uh, uh, actually having these conversations, et cetera, uh, can work. I can, we can actually uh, illustrate some things in the midst of the process as well. Yes. You know, Darrell, it's not unusual. Like, I'll go ride my bike early in the morning at White Rock Lake. Mm-hmm. Not long ago, I came up next to a guy. He was riding slower than me, Mm -hmm. so I slowed down, Uh and I just made a comment about his bike. Next thing you know, we're in discussions about his family Mm -hmm. and about some very hard things. And he said, man, right now my wife and I go to bed every night, and she cries. Mm. 
And over the course of the conversation, I prayed with him, not mm-hmm. thinking anything about it. Mm-hmm. And when we went to split, here's what he said when he went his way, I went my way. He said, thanks for the kindness. Hmm. And that's just what I do, just asking questions. Mm-hmm. Well, you're illustrating something that I think is fundamental, and, and it's part of the reason why uh, I asked you to come in and, and talk about this, and that is because um, what I saw on the on the screen as we, you were playing these various vignettes of conversations that you had was someone just sitting and doing just a wonderful job of listening, um, and then asking what I would call our natural but very um, incisive questions Mm. um, that would allow a person to tell their story. And in the midst of that, um, what was driving them, et cetera. You know, when we talk about this at the center, we talk about the fact that all conversations kind of have three levels. That we, we, we give it a fancy name so it sounds important. Triphonics, okay? So <laughs> that's it's, too fancy. It, yeah, for me. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. It's it's somewhere between stereo and quadraphonic sound. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, but the point is, there's what you're talking about. There's the filter that you're reading that through, and then there's the way your personal identity is wrapped up in that conversation. And uh, and what drives a conversation usually is that base identity level. But most people never realize. They always think they're talking about the, the, uh, mm. the frosting on the top layer of the conversation. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm watching you ask these questions, and, and it's, it's like a, a laser that is going in and very precisely hitting a nerve, but it's not uncomfortable. It's just in a very natural conversation that emerges because you've asked a caring or a sensitive question. Yeah. And it seems to me that that is – in the midst of that, then, you get, you get, dis- you get very honest disclosure um, that's not threatening, uh, that's very honest and transparent, and you're into a level of conversation that usually the small talk that we engage in doesn't quite ever take us to. You know, Daryl, when we went, something I started finding myself saying, I hadn't planned to say it, Mm -hmm. I started telling people, we're here to be curious, kind, and respectful about your story. Mm -hmm. And that thing about getting to the small talk, there are times when I've been riding my bike, and this happened on this trip, when some, at different times, some people joined us. I'm with men my age, next thing you know, I look over, and they are weeping. Mm Mm-hmm from a bike ride mm-hmm. talking. And one of the things that just that we even learned in this is sometimes when I'm riding next to people mm-hmm. in a culture where people are constantly confronting each other face yeah. to face, there's something um, helpful for people when you're riding side by side, shoulder to shoulder, we're together instead of against each other. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, the idea of, of working alongside together is, goes back to Genesis 1. I mean, it's the point of the creation. We were, Adam was created. He was all alone. Eve was put it aside. They were designed to function together. And, mm. and I think the original idea was they were harmoniously supposed to oversee the way the creation worked and then pass that on to subsequent generations. didn't quite work out that way, <laughs> but still, uh, that was the yeah. design. So there's something inherently human in coming next to someone and being being um, supportive of them, but supportive of them not in a not in a condescending way, or not in a way that uh, uh, that says, "Well, I'm just going to accept whatever you tell me as being the way to go." Um, but but in a way that's really interested with what is going on in terms of uh, their lives and and raising questions about why they do what they do and what drives them and those kinds of things. Yeah. So so tell us so tell us a little bit about how we've kind of hinted at how this worked. So how did this work? So you start off in California, right? I'm assuming the weather was pretty decent when you started. It was very nice. And uh, and I assume you just don't have the regular um, how can I say this uh, two wheel 
uh, bike. Uh, I think I've seen your bike. <laughs> yes. And uh, it it looks like uh, I might have to take out a loan to get one. Uh, so so tell us a little bit about the details of, of, of the riding that you did and, and the bike that you had. So the bike I had, um, I'm part of a cycling team. I call myself the old mascot. Uh-huh. And it's actually a custom bike that our team ordered from a company in Arkansas. It's a carbon fiber bike. Custom wheels, pretty high end components, and it's very light. And it, it's, I picked a frame that is made to do something like this. Mm-hmm. And we started off on the Santa Monica Pier. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll tell you, Daryl, I was a little worried because we have a professional camera crew with us. Right. And I was a little worried am I going to pull off? Just what I normally do because I didn't want it to be a yeah because that's an attention distractor yes <laughs> yeah and we're on the pier mm-hmm. we're getting ready to go we're filming and our filmmakers like okay do this again do this again I'm like let's go yeah but next thing you know there was a man and a woman there getting ready to ride their bike and they're looking over at us and I just went and said hi mm-hmm. we start talking we next thing you know we're talking about what they're doing where they're from what they think about God, and boom, within five minutes at the start of our ride, I'm like, oh, this can happen. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the time, it was really interesting. They said something that took me off guard again. Mm -hmm. They said, thanks for talking to us today. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I heard, thank you for talking to us today. Mm -hmm. So, so you get on your bike in California. You've had the first talk. You realize, hey, this may actually go, which yeah. I imagine kind of pumped you up a little bit. Yes. And uh, I didn't ask, by the way, if your bike could win the Indianapolis 500. And <laughs> uh, um, and 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 you start off. And so so you just ride along up to people and start asking them. I mean, did anyone think you're weird? Yeah, I I think everybody at first was like, wait a minute. And, you know, I, I would try to get – in my mind, I would think about this, get super present right now. Mm-hmm. It'd be so present that they're <laughs> going to have to <laughs> listen to you. So I ride up on two guys. They're on motorcycles, pulled off on the side of the highway, and they're in their um, costumes, mm-hmm. motorcycle costumes, and I'm in my bicycling costume. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I start t- talking to them. I tell them, hey, we're riding across the country. We're making a documentary, and we're talking to people about things that matter. And I start talking to these two guys, and it was really interesting because quickly um, – they opened up some kind of door. I can't remember exactly what we said, and we start talking about spiritual things. And I said, "Do either of you guys have anybody in your life that ever talks to you about spiritual things?" And they both said no. Mm-hmm. One guy started talking about going to church, mm-hmm. and he's Catholic, and mm-hmm. he said he goes to church, and he was really open to talking. The other guy was not open at all. Mm-hmm. Finally, he opened up. He went to a Bible college that his grandfather was the president of. Oh, wow. And it was like he had this room in his house, and he had shut the door and never went in it for 40 years. Mm. His buddy who was with him, they are related by marriage, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden says, I've known this guy for 30 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of this about him. Mm. Two things happened there at the end. The guy who finally started talking said, Wow, thank you. I needed to have this talk today. Hmm. But here's what I thought. Wow, we're not just having a conversation here, just us getting to talk to them. Later, those two guys are going to have a conversation. You're not kidding. And part of this thing that I think is so important of engaging people in conversations, we were giving people an outlet to talk about stuff they needed to talk about Mm -hmm. and believing that at the heart of the gospel is something people need to talk about, mm-hmm. even when I'm not around. So that's a example of something that happened. Yeah, and of course, a lot of the clips that you did show uh, reflected this. Uh, I actually, as I'm listening to you, think that having the cameras around rather than being an obstacle uh, actually became an opportunity because the moment you say, oh, we're filming a documentary and we're trying to have – because I was going to ask you, how did you actually walk in and build the bridge into the conversation? And that's obviously a natural one. I mean, after all, having cameras around you while you're riding on a bike Mm -hmm. is – Kind of an attention yeah. getter, and so um, uh, I, I imagine having the cameras around and saying we're doing a documentary. Everyone likes to speak in yes. to where people are. 
Mm-hmm. And so it's like an open, open invitation, yeah. and a lot of people apparently took it. That's right. And sometimes, a lot of times, the camera crew wasn't right there. When it was, it was helpful. But it's an interesting thing, Daryl. Whether the cameras were there or not, people want to tell their story. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when we're coming to have our agenda to talk to people about mm-hmm. the story of Jesus, mm-hmm. just my background of growing up in Campus Crusade for Christ crew, it's easy to forget those people have a story that they want not listen to, mm-hmm. and somehow Jesus himself wants to connect to their story, mm-hmm. and so their story matters. And it's amazing when people got convinced we wanted to hear their story. Mm-hmm. They would listen. They would start talking. Hmm. Uh, it, 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 the whole thing about is fascinating. Of course, uh, you know part of what I also think is going on in the background is when you're out riding or doing whatever you do when when you're when you're doing outside your normal routine and you're not in your normal rush and you've taken the you're taking the time to do that. Um, I I suspect that what happens is with me is what happens with a lot of people. You think about things that other in other places you don't have the time to think about wow. because you're distracted by whatever it is else you're doing. And so that's also a great in because people to some degree are already there in one way or another. Yes. Um, and so the invitation to tell the story is it isn't a matter of you know getting off one highway and gone to another. They're actually in that lane already to a degree. Mm-hmm. And it was a challenge that thing about time. I hadn't mm-hmm. really thought about this about people are so distracted, overwhelmed. Because mm-hmm. several times people would say to us, oh, "I don't have time to talk to you," and I would, which say, is the default mode. Yes. Yeah. And so I would just sit there and. Try to be very gentle, but say, "Hey, can you give us seven minutes?" Mm-hmm. And Daryl was so fascinating. How many times people said, "At fifteen minutes, can I tell you one more story?" Yeah, <laughs> like the gal to me yeah. that I showed at the chapel. Yeah. Who, she was busy. She had all these papers out. She was trying to get to a job, and she just slowly started warming up and heating up as she shared with us her issue about racism. Mm -hmm. And then once we got past that and my response to her was, I'm sorry you have experienced that from people like me, wow, then she started wanting to talk about church and Jesus after that point. Yes. Well, there's a huge... um important point in that, which is uh, that once you build a bridge that shows some um, understanding and empathy for where someone else is coming from, they will meet you at, across that bridge. And uh, um, this is I – I say to people that when you get into a difficult conversation and you know you're in different places, but at the same time you're trying to understand one another, if you will do a good job of listening and, a, and it becomes clear by the way you respond that you've acknowledged that you're listening and the person hears that you're listening, the conversation changes. Yeah. You know, Daryl, makes, that makes me think of two conversations with atheists. Mm-hmm. And they both said the same thing. They were both angry mm-hmm. when they found out I was a Christian. Mm-hmm. And one was going in the Uber as I was going to the airport. Mm-hmm. And this guy just started talking. And next thing you know, he tells me he's an atheist. I tell him what we're going to go about to do. <laughs> and, and, and I basically asked him at one point, so what's your problem with Christians? Mm-hmm. And he said, because they never respect me. And right away I wanted to get defensive and I tried uh-huh. to swallow that uh-huh. down uh-huh. quickly. But I said, hey, what does that mean? Because mm-hmm. I realized in that moment, I don't even really know what he's talking about. Yeah. And I, I decided to take it some time for a couple extra questions. Yeah. And you know what ultimately came down to was this. They never listen. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because the other atheist told me the same thing mm-hmm. when I was in California. and. So I, you know, I told him. I said, "Listen, I, I have one thing I want to do on this Uber ride. I want to be the first Christian that ever respected you. Mm-hmm. So you help me, help me do that. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the ride, I'll ask you." Mm-hmm. 
and that's all I. That was so. You guys were taking an Uber together. Is that what happened? I, I, he was driving, uh, and I was with a. Buddy. Oh, he was the Uber. Yes, driver. Yes, he was the driver. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean those those are interesting conversations. I've I've it, I've. it was intense. Yeah. Um, and and like I say, once you once you communicate that I am actually listening to you. Which, by the way, is not necessarily saying I'm actually agreeing with you, but I'm just listening to you. I'm hearing you, and I'm responding in a way that shows that I'm hearing you. The dynamics of conversation often do change because um, people um, actually kind of like to connect, <laughs> and uh, uh, and I don't think I think confrontation is a reflection of a defensiveness that we all inherently have about protecting our space and mm-hmm. our thoughts and that kind of thing. But once it's clear that thoughts are shareable, uh, it, it changes the dynamic of a conversation. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, your um, experiment kind of proved that. So let's let's talk about some of the, you've you've talked about your atheist conversations. I imagine you met people who are kind of. All across the gamut. You went all yes. across the country and you met people who were all across the gamut in terms of where they were coming mm-hmm. from. You know, Daryl, the first thing that comes to my mind there is so you mentioned I'm a pastor. Uh-huh. I'll tell you, the first seven days were kind of hard on me uh-huh. because of this. The number of people I talked to who were, I'm going to say, my age, your age, mm-hmm. who had just walked away from church. Mm hmm one after another. Mm-hmm. And so um, we go to – we stayed in a different motel every night, which my wife uh, became the comedian on Instagram <laughs> talking about these places. <laughs> and we're coming into this one, and I'm talking to the manager there about just what we're doing. And a lady who worked at the desk said, well, I have some questions for you. Mm-hmm. I said, great, let's meet at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. So I'm waiting at 7 o'clock for her, and I go out there, and, oh, she's in the back room combing her hair. I said, tell her she looks beautiful. Come on, we need to have this conversation. (laughs) And we start talking, and she starts alluding to some things. And I says, sounds like there's a painful story for you there Mm -hmm. in church. And she had experienced abuse in the context of a church. Hmm. And because I had experienced this a few times, and she just – at one point, we just came out with a trailer, mm-hmm. and uh, the guy who made it captured her, and I would forgot about this. She had this little line on the trailer you hear, and it's hard to trust. Hmm. And it's amazing how what happened to some people in the context of a church totally twisted not only their view of God, their view of the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And those were some really hard conversations. So there's that was just one group of people we constantly dealt with. And people who had had experiences, negative experiences in the church had walked away and yeah. and in some cases probably never looked back. Never looked back um, to go again, but but it was constantly um, playing like an operating system in their minds. So every time they thought about the Bible or thought about God, they were on this lifelong journey of developing their own theology. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to use an old old illustration. You remember vinyl records when they used to yes. skip? Okay. Yeah. And you go back to the same track, you know, and it, it never moves on to the music because yeah. it keeps skipping back into the same groove. Uh, that's what that sounds like. It's yeah. like it's stuck there, mm-hmm. and 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 they're constantly trying to, to cope with and make sense out of what's going on in yeah. terms of right. uh, of their experience, and maybe even in some cases to make sense out of the experience because it doesn't make sense to be yeah. in church and be abused. That's, that's right. Those two things aren't supposed to happen together. That's right. Um, well, uh, so okay, so we've got the group that uh, you. So we've got atheists. Okay, yes. I right, met a group of atheists. You just formed clubs as you went along the <laughs> way. Right. right? There was That's the atheist good. club. There was the I was there once club, but not anymore. Oh, who, who else did you meet? Well, let's take the. Um, I'm not against God. I just don't think about him. Mm-hmm. We're going through a little small town, and 
our whole team set is on a, making a beeline to uh, Brahms Ice Cream Shop. I'm mm-hmm. like, hey, we're here to have conversations. Okay, I know why you did the bike ride now. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I, the whole team was in front of us, and I saw three young guys. It was at, at a like city square, and mm-hmm. they were doing something. I said, hey, Wes. Go tell the film crew to come back here. I'm going to have a conversation with these guys. And I, I pull off, start talking to th- these three guys. They're 25 years old, live in a small town, and I think they were playing like Pokemon Go or something. Uh-huh. I ask, and we start having a conversation. And a couple things that happened, they had been friends since they were seven years old. Hmm. So, Daryl, one of the things I tried to do was – as much as I could, I tried not to bring up Jesus mm-hmm. without it connecting to something in their real life. Mm-hmm. So instead of saying, Daryl, I like your purple cups, let's <laughs> talk about Jesus. <laughs> you know. And so I said, do you realize, man, this is kind of unusual for y'all to be connected like this. And so we talk, started talking about their friendship, their relationships. It got into their backgrounds. Uh-huh. And one of the guys had a grandfather who was a preacher, and hmm. he just said he didn't know what he thought about God. but. These three were really um, insightful. They wanted to talk. And I said to him, I said, so what would it take for God to convince you he was real? Mm -hmm. And he said, "Um, I guess he would have to come in corporeal form. Hmm. And Daryl, I was like, <laughs> "Oh my gosh!" And you know, again, I'm trying to hold right, back. Right, you know? right, right. I'm like, dude, that is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you tell me where you got that word? So I'm not telling yeah, him what yeah, it means. Yeah. And um, he said, "From a video game." <laughs> oh wow! I said, "Really?" So I started yeah. asking questions. I said, do, "Do you know what that means?" He goes, "Yeah, that he would come in a body." I said. Do you realize the very thing you said you wanted God to do, Mm -hmm. he did. Mm -hmm. And his eyes get this big around. Uh I said, do you have a Bible? He Uh goes, I I do. I said, let me just say some things about you know, history and documents that the New Testament is, we have so many documents of, containing the New Testament. Uh-huh. We talked about Caesar and how few documents we have with that, just to uh-huh. talk about, hey, this is worth reading. Uh-huh. And then at the end, I said, I want you to do something. I want you to go back and read the Gospels, realizing God did just what you wanted him to do mm-hmm. in Jesus. Mm-hmm. And it was really cool because he said, I'm going to start reading the Bible. Hmm. So there was several people that basically said, don't really know, don't read the Bible. And it's interesting, Daryl, because right now I'm thinking of a a 25-year-old guy from Alaska, a young couple who we met at Cadillac Ranch where they had the Cadillacs (laughs) in the ground in Texas, and she gave me this sticker. All, I would say, young 20s who were all in that same camp. And I feel like every one of them was open at the end of time, said, yeah, I want to go back and see the stories of Jesus. And if I lived in their town, I know we would have ongoing discussions. They were open. They just didn't have anybody to talk to about it. That's interesting because I actually think that one of the things that's happened, you know, we kind of lament the way in which culture has gone and it's moved away from Judeo-Christian roots, et cetera. But I think we're coming up into a period for a lot of people in which the Christian story is not an old story that they've heard a hundred million times, but it's a new story. And they don't know very much about it. And and being able to present that, particularly to younger people, um, has real potential in terms of what it can uh, – in, in terms of having these kinds of conversations yeah. where, where you can, you can uh, move in. I, 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 I've got – there's a last set of questions I want to be sure and ask you when we get to the end. So I'm, I'm saving that in the back of my head, but there's okay. one. Um, so we've got – just to build up, we've, so we've got our <laughs> – we've got our uh, – been there, done that, club. Okay, walked away. Our atheists, the people who are open. Um, did you meet church people who who engaged you at all, or or were they kind of screened out because they weren't so much the focus? You know, we didn't try to screen out anybody, and there. It, one of the things that was fun, as for me as a pastor who's hearing all these stories of people who walked away from church. I think about a guy who we met who was just finishing his court-mandated um, 
alcohol rehab program. Hmm. He was taking his son fishing. Hmm. I saw him with a fishing rod. I said, I haven't talked to anybody with a fishing rod. Let's go talk to him. Yeah. Somebody invited him to a Celebrate Recovery. Hmm. I was talking to a lady who um, was in a quote unquote bad part of town, and I'm using that term because a Baptist deacon was riding with us. Hmm. And that's what he told us about that part of the town. They were selling some dogs. I pulled up. I bought a dog from them hmm. to give away. Uh. And this lady said, yeah, I go to church. Just started going a year ago. Somebody talked to me about Jesus and invited me to the church, and I'm growing in my relationship with Jesus. Hmm. Another couple at a restaurant just weeping as we're talking to them mm -hmm. because of coming to know Jesus. A farmer, 23-year-old couple. His testimony is, my wife led me to the Lord. So we had, it was good to hear those stories in light of other stories I was hearing. So you got a real look at kind of what's going on with people across the country. And uh, um, and do you, have you stayed in touch with any of the people you talked to? Because didn't you ha did you have to get uh, let me ask you this question first. Did you have to get their permission to use these conversations in order to do the documentary? That's something that standardly yeah. often does happen. We've got. Release forms, everybody we talk to. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll tell you about somebody we're staying in contact with, uh, Brandon Glampley, mm -hmm. or Brandon G. Lampley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we had, there was a group of people who were traveling across mm -hmm. the country or hiking. We have several of those people we mm -hmm. talk to. And Brandon's just this interesting guy who loves people and he's just out there kind of living and experiencing life. And so that's one of the guys I stay in touch with. There's some, I'll tell you a story about one lady. I, I told this story at chapel mm -hmm. who um, – we got deep into her story, just her letting us walk in, telling us about a suicide of her mother, mm. disconnected from God, disconnected from art that God had put – she said, I think God gave me that, and asked her to use this Mark journaling Bible mm. and write a uh, – draw a picture as a way to connect. She goes, I'm going to do that. And a month, I said, will you send me the first picture you draw? Mm -hmm. A month after being back, she sends me her first picture. Hmm. And um, I continue to keep up with her. So the way I'm keeping up with people is through Instagram. Hmm. That's we would tell people follow us there, connect uh -huh. with us there, and so there's several people. That so they opt up. in. They basically opt in, or yes, yeah. So Daryl, that was one yeah. of the things I said. We're not going to try to force anything here, right? Right. And if people have kind of talked to us through Instagram, that's how we keep talking to. Them. Interesting. Uh, and, and so. Um, the last set of questions I'm going to ask you, but I'm I'm not there yet, is going to be kind of package what you learned about having these conver yeah. what you've learned about having these kinds of conversations. But um, so so you've got this huge variety of people, and and there seems to me to be something that that is pretty common, at least in the conversations that I have when I'm listening, and that is that people are wrestling with what I call getting located. And what I mean by that is, is that they have their life and they're trying to make sense out of it. And in the midst of trying to get make sense out of it, they're trying to figure out, so where exactly am I? Not just who I am, but where exactly am I? What 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 is life about? And what is my location supposed to be? And I really sense this particularly with younger people um, that they that uh, I was in a conversation last week at a meeting of Christian leaders, and I was listening to them. Um, Complain about the younger generation. Be a nice way to say it, and they, you know, they were going through the standard criticisms of one way or another. You know, they're shallow, or they're it's all about me, and all those variety of things. And um, and I, I chimed in. I said, "Well, I want to come to the defense of young people because I work around young people a long time, and I th I say our world is full of distractions, full of people pulling in this direction, that direction, and and there isn't much location for a lot of people." And what I sense is that people are trying to get located. And one of the things that listening does is it allows the person to tell their story. And in the midst of telling their story, you can sense their search. Yes. Their search to get located. Yeah. You, you know what's fascinating? I know you're using yeah. location as yeah. a metaphor, yeah. Daryl. Yeah. But 
I can think of four conversations right off the top of my head of that uh, search for location translated into people going back to their land. Mm-hmm. The lady who owns the ice caves, mm-hmm. her family owned that land. She went back to the land. This lady who owned a ranch, she had a white collar job, moved back to this ranch. Two Native Americans I talked to who had been in the big city coming back to their land. And really, I think it's um, them actually moving toward that metaphor you're talking about in a real life physical way, but really to try to make sense of the story of their life, Mm -hmm. how it's connected to the story of where they've come from, but also where they're going and trying to make meaning. Mm -hmm. And and so what that means is is that, uh, you know, it's in the midst of a lot of things that get said theologically about people and and their their sin and their blindness and and that kind of thing you know all that is is dislocating um, it does deconnect well we talk the old language used to be you know you're separated from god and 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 that delocation is disorienting yes and uh, I find that one of the com- best conversations I can have are these conversations in which, in which the issue of a person kind of describing kind of where they are and where they're headed, and what matters, um, which I, I I classify them all as location conversations. Mm. Um, and uh, and you know back to the land. A person goes back to their childhood, the things that they were grew up to, things that they perhaps go back to because there was an element of being safe when you were a child. If you were surrounded by people who actually did, you know, look out for your well-being when you were growing up, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and then the ultimate uh, refuge is God. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think there are ways to talk to people that that help them with the location questions that they actually are are hidden underneath their story. You know, Daryl, one of the questions that I – again, I was discovering questions coming out of me mm-hmm. when I was there, and one of the questions that I had not thought that I would ask people, I start asking people th- questions like this, what's your hope? What's your dream? Mm-hmm. And I think that also gets that location of the direction you're moving mm-hmm. and what you think. And it was, and it was interesting how a lot of people actually hadn't had hadn't thought about that, hadn't been invited to think about that. And mm-hmm. man, that leads to discussions. Yeah. About something bigger, which about which, God. which goes back to an earlier image that we're talking about, which is the idea of being distracted. There's so many voices in our world right now. There's so many. Uh, there's what I call a lot of static. You yes. know, uh, things pulling you in this direction, that direction. In some cases, it's purposeful because it's an attempt to escape out of where people may find themselves if they stop and have silence. But in a lot of cases too, it's just there's a lot of noise and a lot of pulling, and 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 if your life becomes intense. Um, actually, being able to stop and be reflective about what you're doing, you may or may not take the op- you may or may not take the opportunity to do, which is, and then when people do it, <laughs> they're riding bikes, you know, uh, they're out they're out in that commune and alone time in which they're trying yes. to kind of recharge, you know, recharge, and uh, all of that it seems to me is pretty pretty important. Okay, let me let me turn to the set of questions I want to close with, which goes something like this. Um, obviously, um, I mean, if you, if you walked up to someone and said, I'm going to do a documentary, I'm going to get on my bike, I'm just going to ask people questions about life, and I'm expecting this to be a huge success, <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of people would go, huh? <laughs> Are you kidding me? So um, what did you learn about having conversations? What, what, because I think a lot of people are afraid to go there. Yes. Well, what we said earlier, people actually do want to tell their story. Mm -hmm. People are afraid because of just our cultural climate, politically, um, just the whole thing that people are expecting somebody to tell them they're an idiot, to discount them. So people want to tell their story, and they're open to telling it when we are curious, kind, and respectful. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I got a greater awareness of 
this thing I call I'm walking on holy ground when I move into your life. Mm -hmm. And to really, even if I don't say that, Mm -hmm. there is something about my approach that Mm -hmm. that affects. And that was so, it was so great to having really my first in-depth conversations ever in my life with Native Americans, because you know they believe that. Right. And they're very guarded. Right. And that takes me to this next thing, that um, having conversations, I have to be willing to be patient and gentle. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes physical people aren't always patient in general <laughs> right, riding right. bikes. Right. Where I ride with a bike team, they're glad to drop you. Mm-hmm. I often ride by myself uh-huh. when I start off with a group of people. There's no patience and gentleness <laughs> in that area with yeah, each right, other. Right. So this idea of being patient and gentle with people. And I talked a little bit about this at the seminary. What I learned, and I think what our culture tells us, you be bold mean, direct, you say whatever you want, whenever you want, you just put a post on Facebook. But when you get face-to-face with people, that only gets you so far. Yeah, not for very long. (laughs) And not for very long. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. And so I think there is, we have to use even, we have to think differently when we're face-to-face than when we're online. I noticed something that you did uh, in the clips that you showed that I thought was I- interesting, and, and that is, I don't know how else to describe this other than you often asked permission. Yes. Um, talk about that. So, Daryl, I, I, I'm riding my bike um, recently at White Rock Lake, and I find out the guy's Jewish. And as soon as he finds out I'm not a pastor, we're riding next to each other about 25 miles an hour in a very fast group. But even in the midst of that, I could tell his wall went up. Yeah. And that asking permission came out of that awareness that, hey, this is his life. Mm-hmm. And when I'm moving in, I, it's like walking into somebody's house. Mm-hmm. I don't just open some, the do, front door to somebody's house and just walk in their house. I knock on the door. It's a form of asking permission. Mm-hmm. So it might be asking permission directly, hey, can we talk about this? It might be knocking on the door. And another way I ask permission, Daryl, is by affirming. Mm-hmm. I'm looking to see how I can affirm. So with the Jewish guy that day, I saw his wall go up. I said, hey, can I just right now stop, not literally stop on the yeah. bike? I want to say to you, I feel grateful for the Jewish people mm-hmm. for helping keep alive the belief in the one true God and protecting his word. Boom. Mm-hmm. The wall starts coming down. Mm. We start talking about family. We both have three daughters. Mm-hmm. All this happening 20, 25 miles an hour on a bike. Yeah. So I think it, that thing is really important, whether it's I ask for however I do it, but that I'm aware that I just don't go barging in somebody's house. So, And that's part of the communication of the respect that we've been talking about, that, that you're respecting the space and coming in kind of, for lack of a better word, one step at a time, but rather than kind of approaching it's like i approach my dog one step at a time the closer i get sometimes the more nervous he gets uh, you know uh, um no it's 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 saying um do i have permission to take your hand and we can walk together yes and sometimes people say no yeah and then you're done and you're done yeah and i don't have to walk away thinking well should i have done this better or that better or, yeah yeah so that, you're done weren't ready that's right yeah yeah, so let's, let, uh, let me uh, ask another question, because uh, a lot of this has been about, for lack of better description, kind of uh, how to engage and how to relate to people. But, um, uh, but there's, a, there's a hidden figure in all of this, um, God. And sometimes I imagine there are coincidences that emerge or things that emerge when you're having a conversation like the, with your Jewish story. You know, you both have three daughters and there's a connection. Um, I, I take it some of that happened a lot. Yes. You know, um, there I'll tell you one story. We pull up t- in Santa Rosa, New Mexico. After riding our bikes for six hours, we had a tailwind. We went 120 miles that day in the shortest amount of time of riding we had the whole time. Mm-hmm. We pull up just the right time. Mm-hmm. They're cooking hamburgers. They're feeding kids. I walk up to one guy, and he talks about a son who died in a car wreck. Mm. 
we had four conversations about sons who died in car wrecks. Mm. Interesting coincidence. Mm-hmm. But also, the gal who was in charge of this program, she had a semicolon tattoo, hmm. which people who have thought about suicide or attempt suicide get. Hmm. And we start talking to her, and it was actually my wife who saw it. Hmm. And Vila was very sensitive to it. Mm. Having had an experience in our own family mm. and a known family member with it, mm. that tattoo. Mm. And you talk about a moment of connection. Mm. And I'm trying to stick to my story, but it, all during the trip, different people on our trip had these interesting moments of connection that ultimately helped lead us to conversations about Jesus. Mm. So we're, we're just about out of time. Let me. Uh, do you have one or two final things you'd like to say about what what you learned or what you what you might encourage people about as a result of your wonderful adventure? You know, I had to give up my agenda mm-hmm. at the very beginning to have any kind of measure of success on this, mm-hmm. especially the idea of. Do I have to come back and report that somebody came to know Jesus? Mm -hmm. And I learned as a new believer, successful witnessing (laughs) is taking the initiative and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. And what I want to encourage people in the context of local church, because one of the things our, our church, I thought, we need to make sure the conversations we have our kinds of conversations our people could have, to, to say, you don't have to make anything happen. Mm-hmm. And if you're free of that, I, I believe you could go out and start having conversations. The other thing, do I have time for this? Yeah, go the ahead. other thing is, people who are hurting want to talk. Uh-huh. We spend significant time grieving with people. Mm-hmm. And out of those moments of grieving with people, we saw some fascinating conversations bubble up out of that. So, you know, when my buddies who say, I want to have more conversations at work, I say, you go find, you pray, God, help me to find people that are hurting, and at least you can say, can I pray for you, and see what happens from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, uh, your first remark has caught my attention, because I, th- I think a goal in these conversations is, is, have I drawn closer to the person? Uh, particularly if it's people I might be around on a regular basis, because um, I mean one of the advantages that you have in one sense is you, you uh, uh, the documentary is you're kind of a random person who pops in and can pop in and pop out. That's right. But um, and oftentimes the relationships we care the most about are the ones where we're close to people. But the question becomes, uh, you know, some some plant, some water, and some bear the fruit. And you never know in a conversation where you are in that sequence as far as God in, right. in God's mind. So I, I think you're right. It, you know, if we, we in our sales pitch world, you know, we want to close the deal. Um, but um, you don't have to close the deal to have had a profitable conversation. If you've brought a person a step closer to thinking seriously about how they are spiritually wired before God, that's been a good conversation. We got a text from a guy who ended up riding with us for a while. Mm-hmm. This is the the most I've thought about spiritual things in years. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great story. Well, thanks, Neil, for coming in and telling us your story about, you know, your wonderful adventure. Uh, and thanks for having me, Daryl. Yeah. It's and let me encourage people. Can I do this? Yeah, Just to follow yeah, us on yeah. Instagram because followers will help us get a book and a documentary out. So thank and, you. And so how do they follow you on Instagram? So Neil Tomba, N-E-I-L-T-O-M-B-A, or you can go to the website, neiltomba.com. And we've also just put our trailer up on the, a YouTube channel, Neil Tomba. Very cool. Well, thanks, Neil, for coming in. We really appreciate it. We, uh, we've certainly enjoyed the conversation. I learned a lot by listening to you. And, uh, you know, 
uh, your next vacation, <laughs> it should be from Minnesota to Texas. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we thank you for being a part of the table and for listening with us. You hope We hope you'll be back again with us soon. And if you have a topic you'd like for us to consider for a future episode, please feel free to email us at the table at dts.edu. Uh, we do take those requests seriously. We figure out, okay, who can we talk to that might help us with this topic and uh, and try and serve you in that way. So we thank you for being a, a part of the show today and hope you'll be back again with us soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well. Thank you.